This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at Israel's bombardment of Gaza, I want to turn to the words of the British-Palestinian surgeon, Hassan Abusita, describing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. He'd been working in the Al Ahli Arab Hospital, which was one of the last functioning hospitals in the Gaza Strip. There was a major airstrike, over 60 killed on a mosque, and Al Ahli was completely inundated with uh, um, wounded. And we were operating all through the night. And by the early hours of yesterday morning, we had realized that we have basically run out of um, medication for the anesthetic machines, and we had to stop the operating room. Um, we had finished. Uh, um, and that's when we made the decision. At the same time, in the early hours of the morning, there was heavy bombing all around the hospital, and really close to the hospital. You could feel the whole building being shot. And we were being, and, and it sounded like tank fire. It didn't sound like air raids. Um, and so we made the decision that it was time for at least the operating room staff to are not going to be able to provide a service to evacuate. And so yesterday morning we left, um, and we could you could hear the sounds of the tanks around the hospital when we walked out. And we literally walked all the way to Nusayrat camp in the central zone. When we left, there were over 500 wounded needing urgent medical care, but needing surgical intervention that we could not provide because khalas, I mean, we'd run out of medication. We'd run out. The operating room could, would no, could no longer function. And at the best, there were two operating rooms in it. We were always overwhelmed with the number of wounded compared with what we were able to provide. The British-Palestinian surgeon Qasim Abusita speaking through his surgical mask in Gaza. Um, we've been trying to reach people there, but it's the second straight day of a telecommunications blackout. This is only the latest one. To talk more about Israel's bombardment of Gaza, we're joined now by independent journalist Sharif Abdelkadus, produced the award-winning documentary the Killing of Shreen Abu Akhla for Al Jazeera's documentary series, Fault Lines, and has reported from Gaza for Democracy Now! and other um, uh, outlets. Sharif, it's so important to uh, talk about what's happening there, even as this telecommunications blackout is happening. Also, the leaflets that are being dropped on Khan Yunus, which is where so many thousands of Pal Palestinians have been instructed to go to heads south, from northern uh, Gaza south, now leaflets are being dropped there, uh, saying they must move further south. Can you respond to this overall situation? Well, I mean, you have a situation where uh, the northern part of Gaza, north of Wadi Gaza, and, and Gaza City itself, uh, which was home to nearly one million people, uh, is now a hollow shell. Um, most neighborhoods in Gaza City and in northern Gaza in general have been very badly damaged or destroyed. Uh, you have these armored columns of Israeli forces uh, going in and tearing up the roads. Uh, electricity, water, um, sewage infrastructure basically no longer exist. Um, and, you know, there are reports that the, 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 there's the smell of death is everywhere, as, as an untold number of bodies are lying under the rubble. Um, the UN estimates that about 2,700 people, including 1,500 children, uh, are missing and believed to be buried under the ruins. And there's reports of the people that have remained in the north digging with their bare hands, uh, trying to find their family members, and the streets have been turned into graveyards. Um, so only a fraction of the people who lived in northern Gaza remain there, and most have been forcibly uh, displaced to the south in scenes that are reminiscent of the Nakba. 1.5 million people have been displaced um, in Gaza. That's nearly double the number that were ethnically cleansed in 1948 and were never allowed to return to their homes. 
And many of these people are people who were displaced in, uh, or their descendants from 1948. So we have to remember that 80 percent of Palestinians in Gaza are not from Gaza. Uh, they're refugees. Um, so most of the Palestinians in northern Gaza are now packed into the south. Uh, there's no indication if or ever they'll be able to return to the north. Uh, the Israeli military effectively controls m most of the, the northern area. And Gaza, northern Gaza is basically uninhabitable now. You know, it's been destroyed. Um, and there's hardly any aid coming in. Uh, you know, Gaza is now receiving only about 10% of its needed food supplies. Uh, dehydration, malnutrition are growing. Nearly all of the people uh, in Gaza, the 2.3 million people, uh, are uh, in need of food, according to the UN. Uh, and as you mentioned, the communication systems uh, are down now for a second day. And this is a more serious telecommunications blackout because it's the result of no fuel uh, to power uh, the Internet and phone networks. So it may be a more permanent uh, communications blackout. And this communications blackout is actually causing disruptions to the little amount of cross-border aid deliveries that were coming in. Um, and as you mentioned, the Israeli forces now have dropped these leaflets uh, just the other day, telling Palestinians in areas east of uh, Khan Yunis, which is a, you know, a bigger city in the south of Gaza, to evacuate. Where are these people supposed to go? Um, it increasingly seems that uh, you know, Israel is trying to f push Palestinians uh, into Egypt, uh, which is a longstanding colonial fantasy. Um, and, you know, there, there are plans that have been documented uh, for this, that th there was a document leaked last month from Israel's intelligence minister uh, that detailed, you know, a durable post-war situation solution for Gaza, which includes the long-term transfer, uh, forcible transfer of Palestinians uh, to northern Sinai. Uh, there's something called the Island Plan, which is named after a retired uh, major general uh, who outlines a proposal to forcibly transfer Palestinians uh, to Sinai. But right now, yeah, we don't know what the situation is. Egypt has staunchly refused this kind of mass displacement of Palestinians into its territory. Um, and it has tried to negotiate uh, aid to come in. But there's increasing pressure right now on Egypt uh, because at the end of the day, this is an Egyptian border, the Rafah border crossing. It's the only border crossing into Gaza that is not controlled by Israel. Egypt right now is letting in maybe 50, maybe 80, maybe 100 trucks a day, just a fraction of uh, the amount of aid that used to come into Gaza even before October 7th. And the reason it's only letting in a fraction is, is that it's uh, allowing Israel to dictate the terms. So it gets approval from Israel of how many trucks can enter the Rafah border crossing. Those trucks then enter, they go up to an Israeli border crossing where they're checked, they come back down and then enter into Gaza. And there's increasing pressure to on Egypt from civil society in Egypt, uh, from, from people around the world, for Egypt to just open the border and let the aid in. If Israel wants to bomb UN aid trucks, uh, then you know that, that's something else. But right now, Egypt is coordinating with Israel on how much aid gets in and people are beginning to starve and uh, infectious disease is spreading because of no water. And it's, a, it's an incredible crisis. Sharif, um, the number of journalists who've been killed, um, I think Committee to Protect Journalists says at least 42 journalists and media workers have been killed since October 7th. It's the deadliest month for journalists since the group began collecting information in 1992. If you can talk about the global response, the global journalist response, and then we'll talk a bit about the latest on Shireen Abu Akhla, who was killed not in Gaza by the Israeli forces, but was killed last year um, outside the Jenin refugee camp. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? Um... I don't know what the number is even now. I, you know, it's at least 35, maybe 40 Palestinian journalists have been killed in just over a month. Um, by far the highest number of journalists killed in such a short amount of time. Um, and, you know, journalists, uh, foreign journalists can't get into Gaza. Israel's not letting them in and nor is Egypt. So you have a situation where uh, you're killing 
most of the journalists, the registered journalists in Gaza, you're not letting other journalists in. And then um, we've seen very problematic coverage from uh, newsrooms, Western newsrooms, uh, of what's happening on the ground, problematic language, and people have been protesting this. And we just saw, um, uh, you know, people have been resigning from the New York Times. The poetry editor of the New York Times just resigned uh, fr from there, uh, you know, because of the language used by the New York Times uh, in this coverage. But also, I, you know, you haven't seen the, the type of outcry that one would imagine from the journalistic community for their colleagues who are being killed in Gaza. And the ones that aren't killed in Gaza have lost so much. They've lost their families. They've lost their homes. Um, when uh, Jamal Khashoggi was brutally murdered by the Saudi government, there was massive condemnation uh, from uh, Western news outlets uh, for the murder, and rightly so. When Evan Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter who remains in prison uh, in Russia, was arrested, uh, there has been and still remains remains a massive outcry over his arrest. But we haven't seen this the same kind of. Uh, outcry over this record number of journalists, that Palestinian journalists that have been killed in Gaza. I think it's, it's deeply, deeply problematic and reveals uh, a bias that, uh, that is, is being laid bare um, in many ways. And as you mentioned, Shirin Abu Akhle, you know, when this all kind of uh, the, the, the assault on Gaza began on October 7th, we saw people uh, post on, on Twitter, uh, on social media, kind of photos of Shirin and just saying that, kind of wishing that she was around, that she was, you know, alive to report because she was such an incredible journalist and so needed uh, in a time like this. Uh, you know, even the Lebanese journalist uh, who was killed uh, in shelling in, in, uh, in southern Lebanon by Israel, uh, one Abdallah. of his last tweets, Haysam Abdullah, yeah, one of, uh, Asam Abdullah, one of his last uh, tweets was a photo of Shirin, and he just wrote Shirin uh, with a heart. And then after he was killed, someone put up his photo and said Asam with a heart. Uh, so, and yeah, Shirin, the latest uh, news about the Israeli army bulldozing the memorial for her where she was killed? Right. I mean, as we heard in headlines, you know, Israel has repeatedly uh, conducted uh, very brutal raids on Jenin, uh, on the Jenin refugee camp, um, uh, which uh, is uh, the heart of um, uh, militant Palestinian resistance in uh, the West Bank. Uh, we've seen uh, drone strikes uh, on Jenin uh, just a few days ago. A drone strike killed about uh, 14 Palestinians in Jenin, one of the deadliest days in the West Bank since 2005. Um, and we saw drone strikes just the other day as well and raids on the hospital. Uh, and during one of these uh, raids, uh, they came in. The site where Shirin was shot by an Israeli sniper has become uh, a memorial area. When I went there last year to report on her killing, there's, there's photos of her everywhere. There's flowers. Uh, there's um, uh, written pieces of tribute uh, that are all hung up. You, the, the tree where she was killed under, you can still see uh, the bullet holes. And um, it's a place where family and friends have sought some solace by visiting this area and remembering Shirin. And uh, an Israeli bulldozer came in during one of these raids and completely destroyed uh, this road and this area uh, where this memorial was. And it doesn't seem well, not, it doesn't it seems to just be some kind of vindictive act because there was no reason to destroy this road that that leads to the entrance uh, of the Jenin refugee camp. Um, they've also, you know, in an earlier raid, they 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 destroyed this um, memorial, which was in the shape of a horse, which was kind of well known in Jenin in a main roundabout, and was built from the pieces of an ambulance that was uh, blown up uh, in an airstrike by Israel in 2002, and it was they used the parts of the destroyed ambulance to to kind of create this horse uh, monument, which was a testament to Jenin's spirit of resistance. They also came in and kind of removed that. Uh, so there seems to be also an, an attack on uh, symbols of resistance to, to Israel uh, as well. Well, Sharif, um, we're going to ask you to stay with us. We're going to switch gears. Sharif Abdelkadus is a journalist who won a George Polk Award for the documentary The Killing of Shireen Abu Akhla for Al Jazeera's Fault Line series. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you.
Please give today at democracynow.org/give.